During World War II, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, Elder Albert E. Bowen, wrote a book compiled from a series of radio addresses which he entitled Constancy and Change. The message of these talks was very timely. We were a world in conflict, and the people of the world over needed a message of certainty, assurance, and stability. The present era seems very similar in many ways to those turbulent year, war years. Today we face many perplexity, perplexing issues in addition to significant international political problems. We are experiencing one of the most difficult economic periods we have faced in many decades. The problem of inflation and personal financial man management. I'd like to borrow the title of Elder Bowen's book and share with you some of my own experiences and convictions drawn from the 60 years of my working life. I've lived during each phase of the economic cycle. As a young man getting started in life, I experienced personal depression. I've experienced a national and international depression, as well as periods of recession and inflation. I've watched the so-called solutions come and go with each change in the economic cycle. <clears throat> These experiences have led me to the same conviction as Robert Frost, who once said, most of the change we think we see in life is due, is due to the truth being in and out of favor. What I would like to share with you today are my observations about constancy and fundamental principles, and if followed, will bring financial security and peace under my any economic circumstances. First, I should like to build a foundation of, and establishment a perspective within which these economic principles must be applied. One day a grandson of mine said to me, I have observed you and other successful men, and I have made up my mind that I want to be a success in life. I want to interview as many successful people as I can to determine what made them successful. So looking back over your experience, Grandpa, what do you believe is the most important element of success. I told him that the Lord gave the greatest success formula that I know of. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will, shall be added unto you. Some argue that some men prosper financially who do not seek the kingdom first. This is true. But the Lord is not promising us just material wealth if we seek first the kingdom. From my own experience, I know this is not the case. In the words of Henry Ibsen, money may be the husk of many things, but not the kernel. It brings you food, but not appetite, medicine, but not health, acquaintances, but not friends, servants, but not faithfulness, days of joy, but not of peace or happiness." Unquote. <clears throat> now, material blessings are a part of the gospel if they are achieved in the proper way and for the right purpose. I am reminded of an experience President Hubie Brown as a soldier in World War I. He was visiting an elderly friend in the hospital, and this friend was a millionaire, millionaire several times over, who at the age of eight, 80 was lying at death's door. Neither his divorced wife nor any of his children, five of them, cared enough to come to, his, to the hospital to see him. As President Brown thought of the things that his friend had lost, which money could not buy, and noted his tragic situation and the depth of his misery, and he asked his friend how, would you, how he would change <clears throat> the course of his life. He had it live over again. The old gentleman who died a few days later said, as I think back over life, the most important and valuable assets which I might have had but which I lost in the process of accumulating my millions was the simple faith my mother had <clears throat> and in the immortality of the soul. You ask me what is the most valuable thing in life. I cannot answer you any better than the words than those used by the poet. He asked President Brown to get a little book out of his briefcase from which he read a poem entitled, I Am an Alien. I am an alien to the faith my mother ta taught me. I am a stranger to God, 
that heard my mother when she cried. I'm an alien to the comfort that now I lay me, brought me to the everlasting arms that held my father when he died. And when the great world came and called on me, pardon me, when the great world came and called on me, deserted, I deserted all to, all to follow, never noting in my blindness that I had slipped my hand from his, never dreaming of my dazedness that the Bible, that the bubble fame is hollow, that the wealth of gold is tinsel, as I since have learned that it is. I have spent a lifetime seeking things I spurned when I found them. I have fought and been rewarded in many a winning cause. But I'd give it all, fame and fortune and the pleasures that surround them, if I only had faith that made my mother what she was. That was the dying testimony of a man who was born in the church but had drifted far from it. That was the broken-hearted cry of a lonely man who could have had anything money could buy, but who had lost the most important things of life in order to accumulate this world's goods. In the Book of Mormon, the prophet Jacob gives us an important counsel in this matter. But before ye seek for riches, seek ye for the kingdom of God. And after ye have attained the hope in Christ, ye shall obtain riches, if ye seek them, and ye will seek them for the intent to do good, to clothe the naked, and to feed the hungry, and to liberate the captive, and administer relief to the sick and the afflicted. Now the foundation <coughs> and perspective of these things are, we must first seek the kingdom, work and plan and spend wisely, and plan for the future, and use what wealth we are blessed with to help build up that kingdom. When guided by this <coughs> eternal perspective, and by building on a firm foundation, we can, can pursue the, with confidence our daily tasks and our life's work, which must be <coughs> carefully, carefully planned and diligently pursued. It is within this framework that I would like to explain five principles of economic constancy. Constancy number one, pay an honest tithing. I often wonder if we realize that the paying our tithe does not represent giving gift to the Lord or to the church. Paying tithing is a discharge of a debt to the Lord. The Lord is the source of all our blessings, including life itself. The payment of tithing is a commandment, a commandment with a promise. If we obey this commandment, we are promised that we will prosper in the, in the land. This prosperity consists of more than material goods. It may include enjoying good health and vigor of mind. It includes family solidarity and spiritual increase. I hope those of you who are not present, <coughs> presently paying your full tithing will seek the faith and the strength to do so. As you discharge this obligation to your Maker, you will find great, great happiness the like of which is known only by those who are faithful to this commandment. Now, constancy number two, live on less than you earn. I have discovered that there is no way that you can earn more than you can spend. I'm convinced that it is not the amount of money an individual earns that brings peace of mind as much as it is having control of his money. Money can be a servant, but a hard taskmaster. Those who structure their standard of living to allow a little surplus control their circumstances. Those who spend a little more than they earn are controlled by, the, by their circumstances. They're in bondage. President Grant once, Grant once said, if there is any one, any one thing that will bring peace and contentment to the human heart and into the family, it is to live within our means. And if there is one thing that is grinding and discouraging and disheartening, it is to have debts and obligations that one cannot meet." Unquote. Now the key to spending less than we earn is simple. It is called discipline. Whether early in life or late, we must all eventually learn to discipline ourselves, our appetites, and our economic desires. How blessed is he who learns to spend less than he earns? and put something away for the, rainy day, for the rainy day. Now, constancy number three, 
Learn to distinguish between needs and wants. Consumer appetites are handmade. Our competitive free agency system <coughs> pardon me, produces unlimited, unlimited goods and services to stimulate our desire to want more conveniences and luxuries. I do not criticize the system or the availability of these goods and our services. I am only concerned about our people using sound judgment in their purchase. We must learn that sacrifice is a vital part of our eternal discipline. In this and many other countries, many parents and children born since World War II have known only prosperous con conditions. Many have been conditioned to instant gratification. There have been, many am ample, there have been ample job opportunities for all who are capable of working. Yesterday's luxuries, for the most, are considered today's necessities. This is typified by young couples who expect to furnish their homes and provide themselves with luxuries as they begin their marriage with their parents. When their parents <coughs> have managed to acquire only after many years of struggle and sacrifice. But wanting too much too soon, young couples may succumb to easy credit plans, thereby plunging themselves into debt. This would keep them from having the financial means necessary to do as the church suggests in the matter of food, storage, and other security programs. Over, <coughs> over, indulgement, over indulgence and poor money manage, managers places a heavy strain on the marriage relationships. Most marital problems, it seems, originate from economic roots, either insufficient income to sustain the family or mismanagement of the income as earned. One young father came to his bishop for financial counseling and told an all too frequent story. Bishop, I have been well trained as an engineer and I earn a good salary. It seems that all through school I was taught how to make money but not how to, taught how to manage that money, unquote. Now while we believe it is desirable for every student to take classes in consumer management. The primary training represents <coughs> responsibility tests less rests with the parents. Parents cannot leave this vital training to chance or transfer the responsibility entirely to our public schools or universities. An important part of this training should be to explain debt. For most of us, there are two kinds of financial debt consumer debt and investment or business debt. Consumer debt refers to buying on credit those things that we use or con consume in daily living. Examples would include installment buying of clothes, appliances, furniture, etc. Consumer debt is secured by mortgage, mor mortgaging our future earnings. This can be very dangerous. If we are laid off work, disabled, or encounter serious emergencies, we have difficulties meeting our obligations. Installment buying is the most expensive way to purchase. To the cost of the goods we buy, we must add, add, be added heavy interest and handling charges. I realize that young families find it necessary at times to purchase on credit, but we caution you not to buy more than is truly necessary and to pay off your debts as quickly as possible. When money is tight, Avoid the extra burden of additional interest charges. Now, investment debt should be fully secured so as not to encumber a family security. Don't invest in speculative ventures. The spirit of speculation can become intoxicating. Many, many future <coughs> fortunes have been wiped out by the uncontrolled appetite to accumulate more and more. Let us learn from, the sorrow, learn from the sorrows of the past and avoid enslaving our time, energy, and general health to a gluttonous appetite to acquire increased material goods. President Kimball has given, given us this thought, provoking counsel. The Lord has blessed us as a people with a prosperity unequaled in times past. The resources that have been placed in our power are good and necessary to our work here on the earth. But I am afraid that many of us have been surfeited with flocks and herds and acres and barns and wealth 
and have begun to worship them as false gods, and they have power over us. Do we have more of these goods than our faith can stand? Many people spend most of their time working in service of self-image. That includes sufficient money, stocks, bonds, investment, portfolios, property, credit cards, furnishings, automobiles, and the like to guarantee carnal security throughout. It is hoped a long and happy life. A forgotten is the fact that our assignment is to use these many resources in our families and quorums to build up the kingdom of God." Unquote. Now, by way of testimony, may I add this to President Kimball's statement? I know of no situation where happiness and peace of mind have increased with the massing of property beyond the reasonable wants and needs of the family. Now, constancy number four, <clears throat> develop and live within a budget. A friend of mine has a daughter who went overseas with a BYU abroad program for a semester. She was constantly writing home for more money. His concern was such that the father called her and questioned her about the need for additional funds. At one point in the conversation, the, doctor, or the daughter explained, but dad, I can tell you where every penny you sent me has been spent. He replied, you don't seem to get the point. I'm interested in a budget, a plan for spending, not a diary of where the money's gone. Perhaps parents should be more like the father of the college boy who wired home, no man, no fun, your son. <laughs> father wired back, how sad, too bad, you're dead. <clears throat> it has been my observation in interviewing many people through the years that far too many people do not have workable budget and have not dis disciplined themselves to abide by its provisions. Many people think a budget robs them of their fr freedom. On the contrary, successful people have learned that a budget makes real economic freedom possible. Budgeting and financing ma management need not be overly complicated or consuming. The story is told of an Im immigrant father who kept his accounts, pay accounts payable in the shoebox, his accounts receivable on a spindle, and his cash in the cash register. I don't see how you can run your business this way, said his son. How do you know what your profit is? Son, replied the businessman, when I got off the boat, I had only this pair of, pa the pair of pants that I was wearing. Today, your sister is an art teacher, your brother's a doctor, and you're an accountant. I have a car, a home, and good business. Everything is paid for. So we add it all up, subtract the pants, and here you have the profit. <laughs> Wise financial counselors teach that there are four different elements to any good budget. Provision should be made first for basic operating needs, such as food, clothing, etc. Second, for home equity. Third, for emergency needs, such as savings, health insurance, and life insurance. And fourth, for wise investment and a storage program for the future. May I comment on two of these elements? Nothing seems so certain as the unexpected in our lives. With rising medical costs and health insurance is the only way most families can meet their <coughs> serious accident, illness, or maternity costs, and particularly those for premature births. Life insurance provides income continuation, <coughs> provides income continuation when the provider permanently, prematurely dies and the family should make provisions for proper health and the life insurance. After this basic, these basics are met, we should by frugal management regularly save to create funds for, the, for investment. It's been my observation that few people have been as successful with investments who have not first developed the habit of saving regularly. This requires discipline and discrimina discriminating judgment. There are many ways to invest. My only advice is to choose wisely your investment counselors. Be sure they merit your confidence by maintaining a successful investment record. Now, 
constancy number five. Be honest in all your financial affairs. The ideal of integrity will never go out of style. It applies to all we do. As leaders and members of the church, we should be <coughs> the epitome of integrity. Brothers and sisters, through these five principles, I've tried to sketch what might be, a char be characterized as the true pattern of financial and resource management. I hope that each of us may benefit from their application. I bear my witness that they are through this church and that this church and the work we are engaged in are true in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.